how does Neuralink work from the surgery to the implant to the signal and the decoding process and the human being able to use the implant to actually affect the the world outside and all of this I'm asking in the context of there's a gigantic historic milestone that Neuralink just accomplished that in January of this year, uh, putting a Neuralink implant in the first human being, Nolan. Uh, and there's been a lot to talk about there about his experience because he's able to describe all the nuance and the beauty and the fascinating complexity of that experience of everything involved. But on the technical level, how does Neuralink work? Yeah, so there are three major components to the technology that we're building. Uh, one is the device, um, the thing that's actually recording these neural chatters. Uh, we call it N1 implant or the link. And uh, we have a surgical robot that's actually doing an implantation of these tiny, tiny wires that we call threads that are you know smaller than uh, human hair. And um, once everything is surgerized, you have these neural signals, these spiking neurons that are coming out of the brain. And uh, you need to have some sort of software to decode what the users intend to do with that. Um, so there's what's called a Neuralink application or B1 app that's doing that translation. It's running the very, very simple machine learning model that decodes these um, inputs that are neural signals and then convert it to a set of outputs that allows um, you know, our participant, uh, first participant, Nolan, to be able to control a cursor. On the and this is done wirelessly. And this is done wirelessly. So we, um, our, our implant is actually a two-part. The, the link has uh, uh, you know, these flexible tiny wires called threads um, that have uh, multiple electrodes along its length. And um, they're only inserted into the cortical layer, which is about three to five millimeters in a human human brain. Um, in the motor cortex region, that's where the kind of the intention for movement lies in. And we have 64 of these threads, each thread having 16 electrodes along you know, the span of three to four millimeters, um, separated by 200 microns. So you can actually record along the depth of the insertion. And Based on that signal, uh, there's custom, um, you know, integrated circuit or ASIC that we built that amplifies the neural signals that you're recording and then digitizing it, and then um, has some mechanism for detecting whether there was a, an interesting event that is a spiking event, mm -hmm. um, and decide to send that or not send that through Bluetooth to an external device, whether it's a, a phone or a computer that's running this Neuralink application. So there's onboard signal processing already just to decide whether this is an interesting event or not. So there is some computational power on board inside the, in addition to the human brain. <laughs> yeah, so it does the signal processing to kind of re really compress the amount of signal that you're recording. So we have a total of thousand electrodes um, sampling at uh, you know just under 20 kilohertz with 10 bit each. So wow. uh, that's 200 megabits um, that's coming through to the chip uh, from thousand uh, channel simultaneous uh, neural recording. And that's quite a bit of data. And you know there is there are technology available to send that off wirelessly, but being able to do that in a, a very, very thermally constrained environment that is a brain. So there has to be some amount of compression that happens to send off only the interesting data that you need, which in, in this particular case for motor decoding is um, occurrence of a spike or not, and then um, being able to use that to, um, to uh, you know, decode the intended cursor movement. So the implant itself processes it, figures out whether a spike happened or not with our spike detection algorithm, and then sends it off, packages it, send it off through Bluetooth, um, to an external device that then has the model to decode, okay, based on these spiking inputs, did Nolan wish to go up, down, left, right, or click, or right click, or whatever. All of this is really fascinating, but let's stick on the N1 implant itself. So the thing that's in the brain, uh, so I'm looking at a picture of it. There's an enclosure, uh, there's a charging coil, so we didn't 
talk about the charging, which is fascinating. Uh, the, the, the battery, the power electronics, the antenna. Uh, then there's the signal processing electronics. I wonder if there's more kinds of signal processing you can do. That's that's another that's another question. And then there's the threads themselves with the enclosure on the bottom. So maybe to ask about the charging. So yeah. there's a external charging device. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's an external charging device. Um, so yeah, the the second part of the implant, the threads are the ones again. Just the the last three to five millimeters are the ones that are actually penetrating the cortex. Yeah. Uh, rest of it is, actually most of the volume is occupied by the battery, uh, rechargeable battery. Um, and uh, you know, it's about a size of a quarter. Uh, you know, I actually have a device here, if you wanna take a look at it. Um, like, you know, this is the, the flexible thread component of it. Wow. And then this is the implant. So it's about a size of a US quarter. Um, it's about nine millimeter thick. So basically this implant, uh, you know, once you have the craniectomy and the, and the directomy, um, threads are inserted and um, the, the hole that you created, this craniectomy gets replaced with that. So basically that thing plugs that hole and you can screw in uh, these self-drilling cranial screws to hold it in place. And at the end of the day, once you have the skin flap over, uh, there's only about two to three millimeters that's you know obviously transitioning off of the top of the implant to where the screws are, and and that's the minor bump that you have. Those threads look tiny. That's incredible. That is really incredible. That is really incredible. And also, as you're right, most of the volume, actual volume, is the battery. Yeah. Wow. This is way smaller than I realized. They they are also the threads themselves are quite strong. They look strong. And and the. Th Thread themselves also has a very interesting um, feature at the end of it called the loop. And that's the mechanism to which the robot is able to interface and manipulate this tiny hair-like structure. And they're tiny. So what's the width of a thread? Yeah, so the, the width of a thread um, starts from 16 micron and then tapers out to about 84 micron. So, you know, average human hair is about 80 to 100 micron in width. This thing is amazing. This thing is amazing. Yeah, so most of the volume is occupied by the by the battery, rechargeable lithium ion cell. Um, and uh, the charging is done through inductive charging, which is actually very commonly used. You know, your cell phone, most cell phones have that. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest difference is that, you know, for us, you know, usually when you have a phone and you wanna charge it on a charging pad, you don't really care how hot it gets. Whereas for us, it matters. There's a very strict regulation and good reasons to not actually increase the surrounding tissue temperature by two degrees Celsius. So there's actually a lot of innovation that is packed into this to allow charging of this implant without causing that temperature threshold to reach. And even small things like you see this charging coil and what's called a ferrite shield, right? So. Uh, without that ferrous shield, what you end up having when you have um, you know, resonant inductive charging is that the battery itself is a metallic can and you form these eddy currents uh, from uh, external charger and that causes heating um, and that actually contributes to inefficiency in charging. Um, so this ferrite shield, what it does is that it actually concentrate that field line away from the battery and then around the coil that's actually wrapped around it. There's a lot of really fascinating design here to to make it, I mean, you're integrating a computer into a biological, a complex biological system. Yeah, there's a lot of innovation here. I would say that part of what enabled this was just the innovations in the wearable. Uh, there's a lot of really, really powerful, tiny, low power uh, microcontrollers temperature sensors or various different sensors and power electronics. A lot of innovation really came in, the, the charging coil design, how this is packaged, and how do you enable charging such that you don't really uh, exceed that temperature limit, which is not a constraint for other devices out there. So let's talk about the threads themselves, those tiny, tiny, tiny things. So 
uh, how many of them are there? You mentioned a thousand electrodes. How many threads are there? And what do the electrodes have to do with the threads? Yeah, so the current instantiation of the device has 64 threads, and each thread has 16 electrodes for a total of 1,024 electrodes that are capable of both recording and stimulating. Um, and um, the thread is basically this uh, polymer insulated wire. Um, the metal conductor is the kind of a tiramisu, tiramisu cake of uh, Thai plat, gold plat Thai. Um, um, and they're very, very tiny wires, um, two micron in width, so two one millionth of a uh, meter. It's crazy that that thing I'm looking at has the polymer insulation, has the conducting material, and has 16 electrodes at the end of it. On each of those thread. Yeah, on each of those threads. Correct. 16, each one of yes, those. Yes, you're not gonna be able to see it with naked eyes. And I, I mean, to state the obvious, or maybe for people who are just listening, they're flexible. Yes, yes. That's also one element that uh, was incredibly important for us. Um, so each of these thread are, as I mentioned, 16 micron in width, and then they taper to 84 micron, but in thickness, they're less than five micron. Mm -hmm. um, and in thickness is mostly you know, a polyimid at the bottom and this metal track, and then another polyimid. So two micron of polyimid, 400 nanometer of this metal stack and two micron of polyimid sandwiched together to protect it from the environment that is uh, 37 degrees C bag of salt water. So what, what's some, maybe can you speak to some interesting aspects of the material design here? Like what does it take to, to design a thing like this and to be able to manufacture a thing like this uh, for people who don't know anything about this kind of thing? Yeah, so the material selection that we have is not, I don't think it was particularly unique. Um, there, there were other labs and there are other labs that are kind of looking at similar um, material stack. Um, there's kind of a fundamental question um, and, and still needs to be answered around the longevity and reliability of these uh, microelectrodes um, that, that we call, uh, compared to some of the other more conventional neural interfaces, devices that are intracranial, so penetrating the cortex, that are more rigid, um, you know, like the Utah ray, um, that, that are these uh, four by four millimeter kind of silicon shank that have exposed uh, recording site at the end of it. Um, and, and um, you know, that's that's been kind of the innovation from Richard Norman back in 1997. Uh, it's called the Utah Ray because, you know, he was at University of Utah. And what, what does the Utah Ray look like? So it's a rigid type of... Yeah, of so we can actually look it up. <laughs> it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's a bed of needle. Um, there's... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, go yeah, ahead, I'm so sorry. Th those are rigid, rigid, <laughs> rigid shank. Rigid, um, yeah, you weren't and, kidding. And the size and the number of shanks vary anywhere from 64 to 128. Um, at the very tip of it is an exposed electrode that actually records neural signal. Um, the other thing that's interesting to note is that uh, unlike neural link threads that have recording electrodes that are actually exposed iridium oxide recording sites along the depth, this is only at a single depth. So mm -hmm. these Utah ray spokes can be anywhere between 0.5 millimeters to 1.5 millimeter. And they also have uh, designs that are slanted um, so you can have it inserted at different depth. Um, but that's one of the other big differences. And then, uh, I mean, the main key difference is the fact that uh, there's no active electronics. These are just electrodes. And then there's a bundle of a wire that you're seeing. And then that actually then exits the craniectomy. Um, that then has this port that you can connect to um, for any external electronic devices. They are working on a, or have the wireless telemetry device, but it still requires a through the skin uh, port that actually is one of the biggest failure modes for infection uh, for the system. What are some of the challenges associated with flexible threads? Like for example, on the robotic side, R1, uh, implanting those threads, how difficult is that task? Yeah, um, so as you mentioned, they're they're very, very difficult to maneuver by hand. Um, these these youth RAs that you, you saw uh, earlier, they're actually inserted by 
a neurosurgeon actually positioning it mm -hmm. near the site that they want. And then uh, they're actually, <laughs> there's a pneumatic hammer that actually pushes them in. Mm -hmm. um, so so it's, a, it's a pretty simple process um, and they're easier to maneuver. Um, but for for these thin film arrays, they're they're very very tiny and uh, flexible, so they're they're very difficult to maneuver. So that that's why we built an entire robot <laughs> to do that. Um, and there are other other reasons for why we built the robot, um, and and that is ultimately we want this to help millions and millions of people that can benefit from this, and there just aren't that many neurosurgeons out there, um, and uh, you know robots can be uh, something that you know, we hope can actually do large parts of the surgery. Um, but yeah, yeah the, the, the robot is this entire other um, sort of category of product that we're working on. And it, it's essentially this multi-axis gantry system that has the specialized robot head um, that has all of the optics and um, this this kind of a needle retracting mechanism that maneuvers these these threads um, via this loop structure that you have on the thread. So the thread already has a loop structure by which you can grab it. Correct. Okay. Correct. So this is fascinating. So you mentioned optics. So there's a robot, R1. So for now, there's a human that actually creates uh, a hole in the mm -hmm. skull, and then after that there's a computer vision component that's finding a way to avoid the blood vessels. Mm -hmm. And then you're grabbing it by the loop, each individual thread, and placing it in a particular location to avoid the blood vessels. Mm -hmm. And also choosing the depth of placement, all that. Correct. Kind of stuff. So controlling every, like the 3D geometry of the placement. Correct. So the, the aspect of this robot that is unique is that it's not surgeon assisted or human assisted, it's a, semi-automatic or automatic uh, robot once you, you know, obviously there are human component to it when you're placing targets. Um, you can always move it or, away from kind of major vessels that you see. Um, but I mean, we want to get to a point where one click and it just does the surgery within minutes. So the computer vision component finds great targets, mm -hmm. candidates, and mm -hmm. the human kind of approves them. And the robot does. Is it, does it do like one thread at a time, or does it do? It does one thread at a time, uh, and that's that's actually also one thing that we um, uh, are looking at ways to do multiple threads at a time. There's nothing stopping from it. You can have multiple kind of engagement uh, mechanisms, um, but right now it's one by one, and uh, you know we also still do quite a bit of just just kind of verification to make sure that it got inserted. If so, how deep? You know, did it actually match? Um, what was programmed in, and you know, so on and so forth. And the, the actual electrodes are placed to vary at differing depths. In the uh, like, I mean, it's very small differences, but differences. Yeah, yeah. And so that there's some reasoning behind that, as you mentioned, like it it gets more varied signal. Yeah, we. I mean, we try to place them all around three or four millimeter from the surface, um, just cause the span of the electrode, those 16 electrodes that we currently have in this uh, version spans, um, you know, roughly around three millimeters. So we wanna get all of those in the brain. This is fascinating. Okay, so there's a million questions here. If we go zoom in specifically on the electrodes, so what is your sense? How many neurons is each individual electrode listening to? Yeah, each electrode can record from anywhere between zero to 40. As I mentioned right mm -hmm. earlier, um, but <laughs> practically speaking, uh, we only see about at most like two to three, um, and you can actually distinguish which neuron it's coming from by the shape of the spikes. Oh, cool. um, so I mentioned the spike detection algorithm that we have. Mm -hmm. It's called Boss algorithm, um, <laughs> buffer online spike sorter. <laughs> nice. It actually outputs at the end of the day, uh, six unique values, which are, um, you know, kind of the amplitude of these like negative going hump, middle hump, like uh, positive going hump, and then also the time at which these happen. And from that, you can have a you know, kind of a statistical probab probability um, estimation of, is that a spike, is it not a spike? And then based on that, you could also uh, determine, oh, that spike looks different than that spike, must come from a different neuron. Okay, so that that's a nice, 
signal processing step from which you can then make much better predictions about if there's a spike, yeah. especially in this kind of context where there could be multiple neurons yeah. screaming. And that that also results in you being able to compress the data better. Yeah. In the center of the day. Okay. That's and, and just to be clear, I mean, there, the the labs do this what's called spike sorting. Um, usually, once you have these like broadband, you know, like the, the fully digitized signals, and then you run a bunch of different set of al algorithms to kind of tease apart. It, it's just all of this for us is done on the device. On the device. In a very low power, custom, you know built ASIC uh, digital processing unit. Highly heat constrained. Highly heat constrained. And the processing time from signal going in and giving you the output is less than a microsecond, which is uh, you know a very, very short amount of time. Oh yeah, so the latency has to be super short. Correct. Oh, wow. Oh, that's a pain in the ass. Yeah, latency really is this uh, huge, huge thing that you have to deal with. Uh, right now, the biggest source of latency comes from the Bluetooth. Uh, the the way in oh. which they're packetized and you know we bend them in fifteen millisecond. Oh, interesting. Uh, time so it's communication constraint. Is there some potential innovation there on the protocol used? Absolutely. Uh, okay. Yeah, Bluetooth is definitely not uh, our final uh, wireless communication <laughs> protocol that we want to get to. It's a highly hence, hence the N one and the R one. <laughs> I imagine that increases N X N X R X. Yeah, that's you know, the communication protocol, because Bluetooth uh, allows you to communicate against farther distances than you need to, so you can go much shorter. Yeah, the only, uh, well, the primary motivation for choosing Bluetooth is that, I mean, everything has Bluetooth. All right, so you um, can talk so to any device. Interoperability is just absolutely essential, especially in this early phase. Um, and in many ways, if you can access a phone or a computer, you can do anything. <laughs> 